It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you. Good morning, Speaker. Uh, the post-secondary sector is at a breaking point with decades of chronic underfunding. Now, as we all know, Ontario's colleges and universities are bracing for the impact of a 50 per cent reduction in international student permits. Under this government, provincial operating grants have been cut by 30 per cent, and at least 10 universities are projecting dramatic deficits. At the same time, international student uh, recruitment has shot up. It's been out, out, uh, outpacing, unfortunately, supports and housing, uh, and that's happened since this Premier took office. Speaker, this government's plan seems to be to always break it and then privatize it, and it's us who pay for it. This time, it's the international students, too. So to the Premier, wasn't it the government's strategy all along to underfund colleges and universities and rely on the exploitation of international student tuition to make up the difference? And to respond, the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thanks, Mr. Speaker, let's do a little bit of contrast here. Under Liberal leadership, continued to increase tuition in this province so that it was the highest in Canada. Under the leadership of Premier Ford in 2019, decreased tuition by 10 per cent. Look at the, the NDP government voted against those measures. Mr. Speaker, yesterday's announcement, historic announcement, $1.3 billion in new funding for post-secondary education in this province and not on the backs of our students. We will continue to make tuition affordable for every student in this province. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The minister knows perfectly well that that is just half of what colleges and universities need. And these aren't just numbers, Speaker. These students came to Ontario with the promise of a better future, with good jobs and a safe place to live, and we need those skilled workers here. But they were sold a bill of goods and given false hope by this government. So, Speaker, what does the Premier have to say to those students who have had their dreams dashed because of this government's terrible decisions? Members will please take their seats. Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know what this Premier said? $1.3 billion in new funding for post-secondary education. Yeah. We are going to assure that students in this province have access and affordability in post-secondary education. We can all agree there's an affordability crisis in this province and across Canada. It's expensive to heat, to eat, for gas, and we acknowledge that. And I, I see USA in the crowd with us today, and thank you for, for your support. And this is why we are doing this. We want to ensure affordability and tuition in this province. Thank you to the Premier for his strong leadership in assuring that that will continue for another three years. Final supplementary. Speaker, the students know what this means. The government has left our post-secondary sector broken. Schools are struggling under the weight of deficits. Students are buried Order. under the weight of tuition and housing and Order. the increased cost of living, but still this government refuses to properly fund post-secondary. For every dollar spent on colleges in other provinces, we are spending 44 cents. For every dollar spent on universities, we are spending just 57 cents. Speaker, back to Government the Premier. Side, come to order. Will the Premier face the facts here that he broke the system so that a select few could make a profit and our students, our economy, are suffering because of it? The member for Essex will come to order. The member for Sault Ste. Marie will come to order. Start the clock. Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would ask the Leader of the Opposition, is she in favour of increasing tuition, just like the, the Leader of the Liberal Party is? She'll hike taxes, she'll hike tuition. What we are hearing from students, I want to thank Vivian Chem from the Un Ontario Undergraduate Student Alliance for this quote. The decision to maintain the domestic tuition freeze for the next three years 
is very welcoming news to students. Yeah. Amid a cost of living crisis and limited opportunities for income, this move will help with post-secondary affordability and allow students to put money towards basic necessities like rent and food. We appreciate the ministry's consideration of this and look forward to having more conversations about other wraparound and sustainable avenues to support students. Mr. Speaker, yesterday we announced the largest investment in post-secondary education in more than a decade, $1.3 billion, dollars, and not on the backs of our students. Thank you. Next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. The Premier has made some pretty shocking statements about his intention to politicize uh, the judicial appointments process. On Friday, the Premier said he intentionally placed former staffers on the Judicial Appointments Committee to select Conservative judges. The Premier's office then tried to quickly walk back the comments, but yesterday in this chamber, he doubled down, saying he plans to personally interfere in the process to ensure that like-minded people are appointed. These statements are being widely condemned as disgraceful and dangerous, Speaker. So my question is for the Attorney General. Do you endorse the Premier's comments on who gets appointed to the Judicial Appointments Committee? And to apply for the government, the Premier. Oh, well, Mr. Speaker, I'm not going to double down. I'm tripling down now. <laughs> We're going to triple down on making sure our communities are safe. We're going to triple down on getting judges that believe in throwing someone in jail when they kick the doors in, put a gun to people's heads, terrorizing their kids, terrorizing the parents to the point that the, parents, the, the kids don't want to stay at home anymore. They're, they're terrorizing communities. And guess what, Mr. Speaker? They're letting them out, not going out on bail once, not twice, not three times, not four times, up to eight times, yeah. put little Johnny back on the street, give him a gun until he can kick the next door in and put the gun to the next person's head and hand over the keys. I'm sick and tired yeah. of judges letting these people out on bail. We're going to hire tough judges, tough JPs. That's what we're doing. Members will please take their seats. Order. Order. We start the clock. Supplementary question. Speaker, I will remind the Premier that it is his government that has overseen the complete collapse of our court system in this province. Speaker. This is Order. not just my opinion. The Federation of Ontario Law Associations has called the Premier's comments a, quote, juvenile misapprehension, Order. saying that the implication is irresponsible, Order. harmful, and dangerous to our democracy. They say that the Premier's comments have put the Attorney General in a, and I'm going to quote them again, position of disrepute. So my question back to the Attorney General, maybe the Premier will let him answer the question, does he stand behind this Premier's undemocratic agenda, or will he stand up for the integrity of our legal system? Members will please take their seats. The Attorney General can reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And there sure is a lot of finger wagging about how the system works or should work, Mr. Speaker. But there's a fundamental misunderstanding of what judicial independence is, and it's not appointing the judges. They are not to be appointing their own. We are democratically elected to select judges, and then they have their independence. So I'll take no lectures from the NDP on how this system should work. Now, Mr. Speaker. It is true that there's, an, there's, an, there's a group, it's called an advisory committee, Mr. Speaker, and they are free to do their work. A quarter of that group are judges. So, Mr. Speaker, they do good work. We take their advice. And you're, we don't meddle with them, Mr. Speaker, but Howard Hampton, the NDP Attorney General in 1992, did meddle with the committee, and you can Google it. There's court case on it. Mr. Speaker, I'll, I'll read in my supplementary his experience as Attorney Bob General with the meddling in the Bob Ray days. I'll remind the members that we do not use props in the chamber. Order. 
Order. Start the clock. Final supplementary. I'll remind, uh, I'll remind the Attorney General again. The Federation of Ontario Law Associations called the Premier's comments a juvenile misapprehension. He has placed two former staffers on the committee to advance a political agenda in our courts. The Advocates Society has sent the Premier a letter saying that his approach poses, and I quote, a substantial threat to the independence of judges and the administration of justice here in the province of Ontario. Speaker, they Order. may not like it, but that's what they're saying. So, Speaker, back to the Attorney General again. He must make clear right here and right now, is he going to move forward on this, or will he show some integrity and condemn the Premier's comments? Members will please take their seats. Put the book down. Put the book down. Put the book down. The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, and I hope I have enough time. Maybe I'll talk about how in 2011 they, the Liberals appointed 12 judges. In 20, 2012, they did 10. In 2013, they did 12. And in 2014, they did 27, Mr. Speaker. And guess what 2014 was? It was an election year, Mr. Speaker. So I, I had a look at, at some, some of the, the donors in their years, Mr. Speaker, and in a period in 2008 to 2010, one third were multiple donors to the Liberal Party, Mr. Speaker, and to nobody else. Mr. Speaker, so we can talk about the record and we can be sanctimonious about how the system should work. Mr. Speaker, Howard Hampton said that there was, you know, he didn't get along with the Toronto left wing bar. Their hope was that whoever had the AG's job would be someone close, someone they knew, someone they felt comfortable with, Mr. Speaker. Many in the Toronto left wing bar did, did in fact, have an agenda, Mr. Speaker. Response? Oh, happy to have the debate later on. Order. The next question. Order. Order. The Leader of the Opposition. It's chilling to hear the Speaker. It is chilling to hear. Okay. The member for Essex will come to order. The member for Sault Ste. Marie will come to order. If you ignore the Chair's request to come to order, we will move to warnings very quickly. Start the clock. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Thank you, Speaker. And I understand why they're so shaken. These are chilling comments coming from the Attorney General of this province. Order. Well, Speaker, I'm going to shift here a little. Good side, come to order. I'd like to get some clarity on the questions that I asked yesterday. After getting caught giving misleading testimony to the Integrity Commissioner under oath, the Premier's former policy advisor and his former Minister uh, for Public Business and Service Delivery both changed their testimony before resigning. To the Premier, my question is, has Mr. Sackville or any other official in the Premier's office changed their testimony to the Integrity Commission? I'm going to ask the Leader of the Opposition to withdraw her unparliamentary comment. The, uh, about the... Uh, withdraw. To reply. Government House Leader, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. The, uh, the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition has uh, uncovered Section 219 of the Integrity Commissioner's report, so great investigative work on the, on the part of the Leader of the Opposition. Had they read beyond 218, they would have seen the consistency of, uh, of both of the Chief of Staff. But look, Mr. Speaker, what we're doing in the province of Ontario is continuing to support the people of the province of Ontario, building more homes across Ontario. For 15 years, they supported a Liberal government that put obstacles in the way of building homes. We are systematically removing every single one of those obstacles so that people of the province of Ontario can share in the dream of home ownership, a dream that the Liberals took away. The Liberals have gone so far as to elect a leader who has the worst record in building new homes across the entire province for crying out loud. In fact, Mississauga is so bad, it is so bad, Mississauga, that while the population of the province is growing, Mississauga's population decreased, and that's what happens when you raise taxes, when you put obstacles in the way, people find other places to go, and thankfully they've got a government here that is doing the job and getting it done for the people of the province. And the supplementary question. 
Speaker, uh, that makes three times since yesterday that we've been told there were no inconsistencies in Mr. Sackville's sworn testimony. But, Speaker, there was an inconsistency. Mr. Sackville said under oath that he did not discuss green belt removal criteria before being briefed for the first time on October 27, 2022. In fact, we now know that he was briefed on green belt removal criteria 10 days earlier. A whole lot can happen in 10 days. We have the email. There's evidence in writing. It was sent to Mr. Sackville's personal email account. So back to the Premier. How can people trust this government when top staff in the Premier's office are repeatedly giving conflicting information about the Greenbelt under oath? And what will the Premier do about it? And to reply, Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. And the, the Leader of the Opposition and the Great Investigative Work has uncovered Section 219 of the Integrity Commissioner's uh, uh, report, Mr. Speaker. But look, having said that, uh, we're going to continue doing what we've done since the beginning. Since 2018, we've been focus focusing on building a bigger, better province of Ontario. You know, you look at a guy like George who went to the GO train station <laughs> today in Mississauga. He got on the GO train, went to work in Toronto for the first time, doesn't have to pay to get on the subway. He said, you know what he said? He said he's actually actually making money before he even gets to his new job in a new long-term care home, uh, Mr. Speaker, that wasn't there before this government came to office. You know how he got that job? Because of the supports that the Minister of Colleges and Universities put in place to allow him to get that job. When he gets home, he's saying to himself, I wish I could live closer to the GO train station, but because of a NIMBY mayor in Mississauga, he couldn't. But thankfully, the license plate sticker and his fees have been frozen because of this government, Mr. Speaker. Spons. We're getting the job done for the people of the province of Ontario. We'll continue to do that for all people, Mr. Speaker, because it's the right thing to do. Thank you. The next question, the member for Mississauga Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Transportation. Across our province, many seniors are currently struggling to stretch their income. The cost of food, as well as everyday goods and services, keep rising. For seniors with limited income, transit fares add on to their financial burden that they are already experiencing. They should not have to struggle to pay for the things they need in their everyday life. That's why our government must continue to protect seniors and reduce transit fees. Speaker, can the minister uh, please tell the House what the steps our government is taking to make transit more affordable for seniors in Ontario? The Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the member from Mississauga Lakeshore for that question and for his advocacy for one fair. Mr. Speaker, I have heard from many seniors across GTHA who tell me that costs continue to rise. Unlike the Liberals and NDP, we are the only party focused on making life more affordable. Mr. Speaker, the successful rollout of new One Fair program is putting money back into the pockets of seniors as double fares are now gone, Mr. Speaker. Yay. Mr. Speaker, on average, this saves commuters $1,600 a year, which goes a long way for seniors who travels across the region. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals couldn't do it. The NDP and Liberals voted against the one fair. Under this Premier, Premier Ford, we got it done. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for that response. It is encouraging to see our government providing tangible financial relief for seniors. Seniors in my riding in Mississauga Lakeshore will be pleased to know that they can save money while traveling within the transit uh, network. Speaker, the minister also raised an important point. Not only did the previous Liberal government not remove double fares, but both the Liberals and NDP voted against the one fare program. That is unacceptable. Unlike the members opposite, our government is putting more money back into the people's pockets where it belongs. Speaker, can the minister explain how our one fare makes life more affordable for the people of Ontario? The Associate Minister of Transportation. Speaker, Bonnie Crombie hiked the monthly pass for seniors 10 percent in her first year as Missaga Mayor. Speaker, over her 10 years as Missaga Mayor, she raised transit fares and raised taxes, making life unaffordable for people. 
With one fare, Mr. Speaker, we are eliminating double fare. So people, including seniors, can visit the place they love, can see the people they love, Mr. Speaker. We are the only party under the leadership of Premier Ford and Minister Sakaria that's eliminated okay. double fare and putting money, $1,600, back into people's pocket. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. For years, this government has been doing everything it can to drive teachers out of our education system, massively underfunding schools and driving up class sizes, refusing to address the rising crisis of violence, suppressing wages with Bill 124, attacking the dedicated professionals who support our children every single day. Now that the Minister of Education has finally admitted that Ontario has a teacher recruitment and retention problem, what is his plan to reverse the damage his government has caused? Respond, Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we are looking forward and planning for changes to demographics as educators retire and as population rises. That's a responsible action of government, but it's a wake-up call to the NDP because this government started three years ago to cut certification times for new educators by 50 percent, which the members opposite opposed. We hired 2,000 net new teachers this year. The members opposite, supported by the Liberals, opposed that effort as well. Mr. Speaker, we also created a transitional certificate to allow teacher candidates to work in schools. That's opposed as well. Mr. Speaker, we have been systematic in reducing red tape, increasing access to certified, qualified educators, which is why we abolished Reg 274 that allows, that allows the best educator to get the job, not those based on seniority. But, Mr. Speaker, by the member's logic, if the Premier is responsible response. for this change, then I suppose in your supplementary you'll condemn the BC uh, NDP Premier, who in their province, the Teachers' Federation, calls it a crisis of teacher shortage. I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Supplementary question. Back to my question. Tears in power, and this government has only managed to make the teacher shortage worse. That's quite a record, Speaker. Teachers and education workers have been raising concerns about the labour shortage for years and have offered to meet with the government to identify meaningful solutions that will address the real reasons why workers are leaving our education system. Will the minister commit today to actually sitting down with teachers and education workers, listening to their concerns, and consulting on solutions before they are announced? Members will please take their seats. Minister of Education. Like in Quebec or in NDP BC, we do not have a teacher crisis like the provinces East and West. We have been determined to plan ahead hire more educators and reduce certification by 50% for the next generation of teachers. But, Mr. Speaker, every effort we have taken has been opposed by the Liberals Order. and the New Democrats, and that seems inconsistent with our collective responsibility to ensuring qualified educators. But, Speaker, if the logic of the members opposite is government is responsible for the exodus of individuals from the workforce, then they will condemn the NDP Premier of BC, who said in their problems, the Teachers' Federation called it a crisis. The Liberal uh, government in Newfoundland Labrador is scrambling, quote, to fill dozens of teacher vacancies. It's a national challenge, but this province, unlike the rest of the country, has a plan. Perhaps you should support it. Thank you. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. At a time when costs continue to rise, the federal government has increased the carbon tax five times. So, since the implementation of this punitive tax, the people of Ontario have been paying more and more every single day for food, for services, and for transportation. And even worse, the federal Liberals, Liberals are planning an additional seven increases by 2030. So the carbon tax is making life more expensive for everyone, including the trucking industry, which plays a critical role in transporting the goods we need in our daily lives. Speaker, can the minister please further explain the impact of the federal carbon tax on the Ontario's trucking industry? And to reply, the Minister of Transportation. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. This government is proud to stand shoulder to shoulder with our truckers all across this province, Mr. Speaker. Whether it's about making sure our grocery shelves are stocked, whether it's our hospitals that get the equipment that they need, or the manufacturers get their parts that they need to build Ontario-made products, this government has always stood with truckers, and we have always stood against the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. We know that the carbon tax makes life more unaffordable. Mr. Speaker, for a long-haul truck driver, the Ontario Trucking Association estimates that the 17.4 cents per litre fuel costs seven, $15 to $20,000 per truck every single year, Mr. Speaker. That's a hard worker, hard-working truck driver that could spend that $15,000 on their family, on their child, Response. putting them in hockey practice, putting them in hockey or extracurriculars. But the failed policies that are supported by Bonnie Carby, the Liberal, I mean the NDP, and the Federal Minister of Environment have been hurting their families. Thank you. The supplementary question. Back in the Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response and his dedicated work for the people of Ontario. It's the hardworking men and women in our trucking industry who deliver the goods that keep Ontario moving. But, Speaker, the impact of the carbon tax on the trucking industry ultimately affects all families and businesses in every corner of our province. The cost to fuel the trucks to transport the goods is passed on to consumers as they purchase the daily necessities. Unfortunately, the Liberal members are ignoring their constituents' concerns about the rising cost of living. Our government must continue to stand behind the people of this province and call on our federal counterparts to do the same. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the carbon tax impact the, impacts the trucking industry and all Ontarians? Mr. Transportation. Mr. Speaker, $15,000 to $20,000 every year, every year taken out of the pockets of hardworking truckers in this province, money that could have gone to their families. Mr. Speaker, the carbon tax is a tax on hardworking families that use the money that need to fill up their cars, heat their homes, and rely on truckers. But, Mr. Speaker, the federal government has not listened to our request to make life more affordable. In fact, they've doubled down. Their federal environment minister said he's not going to invest in any more roads or highways, Mr. Speaker. And that's absolutely ridiculous. That's why I invited him to join me to drive on the DVP, to drive on the Gardner Expressway, the 427 and 410, to see how out of touch they are with the realities of the people that live in the GTA, in Ontario, and all across Canada, Mr. Speaker. We call on the federal government to drop the carbon tax and to build more roads and highways all across Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Three to the Premier. While housing starts fell 7 per cent in Ontario, in British Columbia, where that, where that government actually implemented many of the Ontario Housing Task Force recommendations, housing starts rose 11 per cent. This province ignored the advice of their own experts, then took over $3 billion in development revenue away from municipalities with Bill 23. Many of them are now facing double-digit tax increases. This Premier broke his promise to return lost revenue and make municipalities whole. Homeowners are now paying for this government's broken promise. When will this government follow the advice of its own task force, stop stealing revenue from Ontario's cities, and start treating municipalities as true partners in Okay. That's intemperate language. I'm going to ask the member to withdraw the unparliamentary remark. Withdrawn. And to reply, the government house leader. Very much, Mr. Speaker. It shows you just how out of touch the NDP are. So the member is getting up in his place today on a day when we have Habitat for Humanity in the galleries. He's getting up on his place and saying that municipalities should charge people like Habitat for Humanity for building homes through development charges. You know what we've done? We've alleviated those development charges for affordable housing, Mr. Mr. Speaker. You know why we've done that? Because we've got more homes in the ground in this province over the last three years than at any other time in the province's history. You know why? Because we're removing obstacles, not putting them in the way. In the member's own community, in the member's own community last week, they just voted against building another 120 uh, new affordable homes on a highway for crying out loud. That is who the member supports. That is who he protects. You know who we support and protect? Those Lots. people that want to build 
homes that want to give people a dream, Mr. Speaker, and want that dream to come true, like Habitat for Humanity, who do not have to pay development charges on their properties, Mr. Speaker. You know why? Because we made the changes, and we're going to continue to support our organization. Supplementary question. Back to the member for Niagara Centre. Speaker, through you, in a recent op-ed, Amos Executive Director Order. stated provincial municipal financial arrangements are not working for communities, businesses, industries, property taxpayers, and the homeless. With Bill 23 constraints on development charges, municipalities are turning to their only available options. They're hiking property taxes and user fees to increase revenue or cutting services to fund essential infrastructure investments. Speaker, 24 municipalities have now failed to qualify for this government's failed Building Faster Fund because this Premier and Minister can't seem to figure out that a municipality is responsible for issuing approvals, not putting shovels in the ground. When will this government end this incompetence and return this lost revenue to our municipal partners as they promised? Reply, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. It's really amazing, right? It, it just shows how completely irrelevant the NDP have come on the day-to-day -day lives of the people of the province of Ontario, that he gets in his place and tries to defend taxing the people of the province of Ontario more, taxing people who want to build homes, taxing people who want to move into the homes, taxing a dream. That is the NDP. We've seen what happens when you do that, Mr. Speaker. You know what happens? They did it in Mississauga. And you know what happened in Mississauga, Mr. Speaker? People left Mississauga. You know why? Because in Mississauga, the mayor of Mississauga, who is now the leader of the Liberal Party put obstacles after obstacles after obstacles in the way, and while the rest of the province was growing, people were leaving Mississauga. Now, George, who I talked about earlier, who's got a job, he used to be in manufacturing, and you know what George said? He left manufacturing because it's a hallmark of Liberal policies. When he was in, they left. When Conservatives are in, manufacturing is back and strong. The Liberals ruin Ontario. The NDP are completely irrelevant in the province of Ontario. The only one that stands up for the people Response. of the province of Ontario and gives you the dream of home ownership and gives you a key is the people in this caucus over here, and it is this premier. And conservatives will always be stop the clock. Members will please take their seats. Order. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, Ontarians have been subject to a bombardment of government self-praise in recent weeks. The government spent taxpayer dollars on one of the most expensive advertising spots you can buy, a Super Bowl ad, to give themselves a pat on the back. To make matters worse, they won't tell Ontarians how much of their money was spent. Last week, the Minister of Finance said he would get back to us with that number. We're still waiting. I wonder if he checked under all the brown envelopes in the Premier's office. It's just one more example Order. of this government's irresponsible spending and refusal to be transparent. Super Bowl ads and foreign spas, while universities beg for help, 2.2 million Ontarians don't have a doctor, cities declare opioid crises, and Ontarians use their credit cards to access health care. Mr. Question. Speaker, when will the Premier tell Ontarians how much of their money he spent on a Super Bowl ad while failing to deliver for the people of this province? And to reply, the Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you for the member opposite for the opportunity to answer this question. Mr. Speaker, who is against promoting Ontario? Anyone in this House? Yeah. It seems like the Liberals are. Yeah. Well, maybe they would promote the fact that they drove 300,000 jobs out of this province, Mr. Speaker. This government has supported the conditions so 700,000 new jobs were created in this province. That's the, that's the party that they haven't seen a tax or a fee that they didn't want to increase, Mr. Speaker. It's this government that's got the backs of businesses and people and workers in this province. We're reducing the cost of everything, including cutting gas taxes, reducing fees, making it easier, tuition freezes, etc., so that the people of this province can have the best province in all of North America, may I say, in the whole world. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
The supplementary question, back to the member for Don Valley West. Thank you, Speaker. Ontarians know all is not well, despite this government's desperate and expensive attempts to change the channel. Does the minister, do the minister and premier know that since July, 300,000 full-time jobs disappeared in Ontario, all while he's been doling out taxpayer money to his friends? The premier is looking for a way to hide from the $8.3 billion Greenbelt scandal, the backroom deal to give away Ontario Place to a foreign spa for 95 years, and lucrative sole source contracts he gave to large American companies at the expense of small Ontario business owners. The Premier needs to remember he isn't spending his own money. It's the people's money, and they have a right to know how it's being spent. Speaker, back to the Premier. How does he justify spending millions of taxpayer dollars to pat himself on the back when business Question. confidence is at historic lows, unemployment is rising, and he's nowhere close to building 1.5 million homes? And to reply, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Talk about a few numbers. As of this morning, since this Premier was elected, we have 700,000 new jobs created in the province of Ontario. Last year alone, 180,000 jobs were created here in Ontario. We said it yesterday and we said it last week, but we'll say it again. In 2023, Ontario created more manufacturing jobs than all 50 U.S. states combined, Speaker. Last month, Ontario led the nation in job creation. Nearly 24,000 new jobs were added in, on, uh, in our economy just in the month of January. 9,700 of them were in construction, Speaker. Ontario accounted for 65 per cent of all jobs created in this response. We are leading the nation in job creation. Order. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Transportation. There there are families and individuals in my riding of Newmarket Aurora who rely on public transit as their main form of travel. But, Speaker, they have told me that they are concerned that steep transit costs are adding further pressure to their household budgets. Commuters are looking to our government for solutions that will make traveling easier and more affordable. We must continue to deliver on our commitment to bring financial relief to transit users. Speaker, can the minister highlight what our government is doing to keep costs down for commuters across the GTA? The Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you to the member from Newmarket Aurora for that question and for her advocacy here, for here. one fare. Mr. Speaker, as we have many young people in the gallery today, because of one fare and the leadership of Premier Doug Ford, students like them, when they commute five days a week to school, Mr. Speaker, they save $1,600, Mr. Speaker. That is why we implemented One Fair, a fully funded initiative by this government. And Mr. Speaker, this is going to be a game changer, not just for students, for their parents, for their for seniors as well, Mr. Speaker. As a, as a reason, when I graduated right after university, my first job was in Mississauga. So I used to commute from Scarborough to Mississauga, paying double fare, triple fare every day, Mr. Speaker. I understand the struggle. This government understands the premiers. This premier understands the struggle. Our caucus members understand the struggle, Mr. Speaker. But the Bonnie Crombie, they don't understand the need of every day. On Order. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for that reassuring response. Speaker, there are people in my riding who rely on public transit to go to work, school, and to run errands. <coughs> Having convenient and affordable transit options is essential to save them time and money. 
That's why our government must ensure that we are making proactive changes that will provide financial relief to commuters across the province. We must keep costs down for the hard-working people of this great <laughs> province. Speaker, can the Associate Minister provide further details on the One Fair program and how it improves Ontarians' public transit experience? That's a good the Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With One Fair, it's all about affordability. Ontarians can use any form of payment now. Presto card, debit card, credit card, hassle-free, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, students like them, they, when they commute starting yesterday, Mr. Speaker, there is no change in the how they tap. There is no change in how they take transit. There is only one change, Mr. Speaker. They are going to save money. Yeah. Like seniors, like parents, or more than 600,000 students across GTHA, they take, they rely on public transit every single day, Mr. Speaker. And this is not just the impact on students. This is the impact on seniors. This is the impact on their parents, Mr. Speaker. As I mentioned, when I used to take public transit from Kennedy Station to Spons. Kipling, take TTC and go to Misaga, during that time, under leadership of uh, Liberals, we pay double fare. Under the leadership of this government, we are paying one fare, Mr. Speaker. Order. Thank you. The next question, the member from Mishkigawak, James Bay. Merci, Mr. President. Mr. President. My question is to the Minister of Natural Resources. Seven months ago, four Ontario traveled 1,000 kilometers to, eat, to meet Minister Smith to talk about the tragic realities they face, to be reclassified and recognized as firefighters. Their minister told them he couldn't make any uh, promises because he wanted to make an informed decision. Speaker, the fire season is upon us again. The Minister of Labour said yes yesterday that forest, fires, forest, forest fire, firefighters can receive presumptive WSIB coverage for occupational diseases. But they voted no last week to an NDP motion to do exactly that to the minister. Can you confirm, can you confirm how this will be done? Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Speaker, I'm happy to. It'll be done just like how we delivered in Working for Workers 4. The NDP members opposite put forward a good private member's bill, Speaker. But you know what? If we accepted their private member's bill on esophageal cancer, <laughs> firefighters, uh, it, pro the proposed retroactive, retroactive coverage only applied after 20 years of service. We lowered that to 15 years because we learned. You know, we can sit down and get to a better result for families like the Bowman family. Stop playing politics on this. Come to the table. Work for firefighters as this Premier and this government's done, and let's get it done. Stop with the cheap shots. Once again, I'll remind members to make their comments through the floor. The next, or the supplementary, is by the member for Thunder Bay Superior North. Thank you. I have yet to hear this uh, minister actually say the word forest firefighters. I remind the government that uh, only a week ago you voted against a, an amendment that would have included forest firefighters under WSIB coverage. So I'm glad that the minister has finally decided to come to the table, even if it is late. So we need to know exactly how and when the government intends to recognize wildland fire rangers as firefighters in legislation. Legislative recognition also means supplying them with the proper PPE so that these firefighters have a chance not to become sick in the first place. Recognizing wildland firefighters as firefighters means better training and having a retention strategy, which means better pay, so there's not a shortage of available fire crews as wildfires threaten our communities earlier and earlier each year. Question. Will the minister commit to including wildland firefighters as firefighters in legislation with the necessary reports to protect these workers from exposure to toxins before the start of this year's fire season? Members, so please take their seats. Members, Minister for Natural Resources and Forestry. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And you know, I, I want to thank my colleague, the Minister of Labour, for his comments that have been very clear about what our plans are for the future for our wildland forest fighters. M Mr. Speaker, we continue to make investments not only in our forest firefighters but in communities all throughout Ontario to keep them safe. We are making investments to make sure that our firefighters have everything they need to do the job in this province. In fact, the previous government, their budget was $69.8 million a year. We raised that base budget 92 per cent to $135.9 million a year to make sure that our firefighters have what they need to do the job. Mr. Speaker, we care about their safety. We care about the safety of communities, individual and infrastructure here Order. in Ontario. We will continue Response. to work with our forest firefighters. And in fact, it is recruitment time right now, Mr. Speaker, and I call upon the opposition to help more people be up for Thank you. The minister will take his seat. The next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. I didn't see the part in the Conservative playbook where it says we need bigger government and subsidies for monopolies. But last week, the government chose to reverse the OEB's decision that supports fairness for all ratepayers and would have created an open and fair market to help Ontarians get off fossil fuels and switch to cheaper, cheaper, cleaner alternatives. But the Premier is sticking you and you and you and you and all of us with the bill again. Customers would have saved $2 billion in the, in the next five years, but they sided with Enbridge and the $19 million CEO. Last year, global spending in the clean economy was $1.8 trillion, up 17 per cent from the year before. But we are missing out on jobs and investments. Why? Because ratepayers are subsidizing fossil fuel gas. Will the Premier commit to subsidizing heat pumps and stop funding a gouging, greeting, polluting energy monopoly? To respond, the Minister of Energy. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, and thanks to the new member of the Green Party for the question. I believe it's her first question uh, in the legislature. Second question in the legislature. I missed the first one. Um, you know what? It's really, really important that the people of Ontario understand that the Green Party has been fairly consistent in their views on uh, where we're going, while the NDP and the Liberals continue to try and figure out what it is uh, that they want to do. What I can tell you is what we're doing here in Ontario as the government of Ontario and the progressive conservative government is ensuring that we have a diverse energy system, one that is reliable for the people of Ontario so that we will continue to see the growing economy that we've been experiencing, that the Minister of Economic Development just explained to the Liberal members uh, in their small caucus here, uh, is that we are seeing thousands, hundreds of thousands of jobs coming back to our province Response. because we have a reliable, affordable and clean energy sector here in Ontario, one that's seeing Ontario become the engine of Canada's economy. Supplementary question. Back to the member for Kitchener Centre. Mr. Speaker, what raises energy bills is making 4 million ratepayers pay more and giving those dollars to Enbridge, a company that made $16 billion last year in profits. So that you can pay, you can pay, you can pay, and you can pay for a bad investment. That's what the OEB said. It's a bad investment. This will raise energy bills. It will stick homeowners with outdated polluting technologies and higher heating costs for decades. Yeah. Technologies that make us sick, that are burning our province down, and the fires are coming this summer. We are in a housing crisis, and we need to build more homes, not lemons, that need retrofits Order. in a few years. For years, we've seen report after report after report showing that renewables are cheaper, safer, and cleaner than fossil fuels. So why the double standard? Speaker, will the Premier Question. save Ontario money? Will they create jobs and allow Ontarians to start switching to clean energy sources instead of giving money to Enbridge and make a fair market that will create jobs for everyone? And the Minister of Energy. Speaker, this is why the Green Party has hit their ceiling. Uh, two seats in the legislature, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, they're on their way up, but this is as far as they're going to go. If this is the way they're going to talk to the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, because you know what we need 
is a diverse energy sector. Now, the Green Party members and the NDP can look up at the members of the Canadian Propane Association who are here today and tell them, get out of our province, we don't want you anymore, because basically that's what they're saying, Mr. Speaker, when there are people across this province that live in rural and northern parts of our province that need propane, Mr. Speaker. They need natural gas to heat their home. They need a reliable, affordable, clean energy system. And we're lucky. We're very, very lucky that we live in one of the cleanest jurisdictions in the entire world Spons. when it comes to energy. 3% of the province's emissions are coming from our electricity sector, but they want us to shut down natural gas plants, Mr. Speaker. The NDP energy critic wants to shut down natural gas and nuclear, Mr. Speaker. Where would that Thank you. Next question, the member for Peterborough, Kawartha. Thank you, Speaker. I've got a question for the Minister of Finance. When I meet with businesses and residents in my riding, I constantly hear how the federal carbon tax is putting pressure on the local economy and making businesses far more expensive to run. Speaker, that's why I find it so disappointing that the federal government continues to play politics and not eliminate the carbon tax. In fact, they're going to increase Shame. it in just a month or so. At this time, families, individuals, and local businesses in all communities across Ontario need to feel supported by their governments and not penalized. This government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, recognizes that the carbon tax is unfair to hardworking Ontarians, especially those in rural Ontario. And that's why we continue to advocate for every one of them. Speaker, can the minister please explain question. how the federal carbon tax is hurting the people of Ontario? Oh, good question. Mr. Finance. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite with one of the best named uh, ridings, uh, Peterborough. Um, thank you very much for that question. You know, as I said it before in my previous answer to the other question, the independent Liberals never found a tax they didn't love. In fact, just last week, their party refused to support the great member from Simcoe Gray's motion to eliminate the carbon tax and make goods more affordable across the province. Mr. Speaker, the Bank of Canada has said that carbon tax drives up inflation, and even some in the NDP have finally abandoned it. Mr. Speaker. Yet somehow, these Liberals continue to support this regressive and punitive tax. Mr. Speaker, instead, our government is the one standing up for hardworking Ontarians day in and day out. And the supplementary question, back to the member for Peterborough Court. Thank you, Speaker. And that is, it's Peterborough, not the borough of Peter. Thank you to the minister for his response. We've heard the experts, we've heard from other governments, and we've heard from the people of Ontario. The carbon tax harms families, it harms businesses, it harms everyone across right. this province. With the Bank of Canada's high interest rates and the cost of living so high, it's never been more important for governments to try to keep costs down That's right. for people and businesses. Our government has been very clear. We're working to put more money back into the pockets of the people of this province. That's why it's perplexing that the independent Liberals have failed to once again stand up with us against a tax that's driving up prices and making life more expensive Question. for the constituents. They never meant Through you, Speaker, can the minister please explain why we need to fight the carbon tax to provide support to the people of Ontario and the businesses in Ontario? You can't afford Minister Finance. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the great member from Peterborough, Kawartha, for that question. You know, the independent Liberals are following the lead of their federal counterparts and playing politics with the people of Ontario. This is the party, Speaker, Mr. Speaker, whose interim leader called our gas tax cut a relief measure. And yet later, Mr. Speaker, guess what happened when the camera wasn't on? He voted against extending the cash tax cut and voted against bringing down the price of fuel for Ontario families and businesses, Mr. Speaker. And this is the party whose new leader refused to say that she was against the carbon tax and refused to commit supporting fewer taxes for the people of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, it's time for these independent Liberals to decide if they are for the people of Ontario 
or if they are for an expensive and tax-loving federal government. Tax <laughs> the next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. 134,000 people in the Ottawa region don't have a nurse practitioner or a family doctor. They're part of 2.3 million people in Ontario that don't have that coverage. These neighbours rely on unsuitable walk-in clinics or crammed hospital emergency rooms to get basic health care needs. For weeks, I've heard the government talk about plans to open 78 primary care practices, but we don't have any details. Will the government today commit to providing a public list of these 78 clinics? To respond, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Here it, uh, it gives me an opportunity to once again talk about the expansions that we are doing in primary care, multidisciplinary teams. 78 teams across Ontario, all of course who have been notified and celebrated. You know, whether it's in Woodstock, whether it's in Orillia, whether uh, across Ontario, we have expansions happening in the province of Ontario. And as well as that, our investment is going to ensure that the existing multidisciplinary teams, whether they are a nurse practitioner led team or a FIT or a full family health team, is also getting additional operating dollars because, frankly, they've been ignored for 12 years. Zero operating expansion in the past 12 years. We are making sure that not only the primary care multidisciplinary teams that are Response. operating across Ontario today, but as well as the 78 new and expanded, we are getting it done for the people of Ontario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker. Back to the minister. I would hope that getting it done in primary care requires telling the people of Ontario who fund our work which 78 clinics are being funded. And we still don't have an answer from the minister today. Which successful 78 clinics are going to be funded? I hope in her response we're going to finally hear a commitment to produce that list. Because what I do know about the government is that in 2022 they promised to spend two bucks per Ontarian, $30 million, on a budget of $200 billion to expand primary care, and they didn't spend the money. So now we're hearing about expansion, but we don't have a list. So again, Speaker, very clear, yes or no. Will the people of Ontario get this list of 78 clinics today? The Minister of Health. As I have mentioned, all primary care expansion teams, multidisciplinary teams, have been notified of their successful application. We have had multiple uh, announcements that have been so well received in community, including, of course, in the Ottawa region. We'll continue to make these investments because as we expand access, whether it is through uh, additional physician seats, whether it is additional uh, nurse practitioner or RN seats in our post-secondary institution, we're also making sure that those job opportunities are available here in Ontario in communities, whether it is in hospitals, whether it is in our public health health units, whether it is in community care or, of course, expansions of primary care multidisciplinary teams. We will continue to do this work to make sure that everyone who wants and Response. needs a primary care physician has that opportunity with these expansions. Absolutely. Thank you, Speaker. And the next question, the member for mississauga Malton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, I still remember the chilling winter of February 2000, my first winter. I got a part-time job and I had two choices. Number one, take Brampton Transit to Westwood Mall, take TTC and pay $5 or walk five kilometers. Mr. Speaker, as a newcomer, I picked five kilometers many times and had to struggle to make those tough choices. Thankfully, we have a government proudly rolled out our one fair program that the residents like me don't have to pick between tough choices or money in their pocket. Speaker, resident in my riding of Mississauga Malton and across GTA are thrilled to learn about the saving and the impact this will have on their household budgets. You know, Mr. Speaker, far too long, transit needs of individuals and families across our province were neglected under the previous Liberal government. In contrast, our government is continuing to make transportation improvement through strategic investments. So, Speaker, thank you. Thank you. The Associate Minister of Transportation. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Mississauga Mountain for that question and for his advocacy for One Fair, Mr. Speaker. Through you, the successful launch of One Fair means world to me and our government because we understand how impactful this is for Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thanks to Minister Sarma for initiating this, and thanks to Minister Stancho for his hard work, Mr. Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Members across the aisle, from Mississauga, across the region, they know under the previous Liberal government, transit became unaffordable. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, Liberals and NDP had the opportunity to support the people of Ontario by voting in favour yeah. of one fair. But Mr. Yeah. Speaker, Liberals and NDP voted against Response. one fair, not just once, Mr. Speaker, they voted against twice. Why? Yeah. Yeah. Why? Supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, Associate Minister, for your response and recognizing the wonderful work this whole caucus is doing and the ministers are doing. It's great to hear how this government is standing up for the public transit riders. Speaker, when we were elected in 2018, we promised to make life more affordable for the people of Ontario. That's why we must continue to make historic investments in public transit so that we can put more money back into the commuters where it belongs. I know the minister has spoken to the riders across the GTA, including his own community of Scarborough Rouge Park and about what they expect from their public transit experience. Through you, Mr. Speaker, can the minister Question. explain what the successful launch of One Fair means for the commuters and whole Ontario? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again uh, for the member for his advocacy for One Fair, Mr. Speaker. I had the opportunity to visit uh, regions across GTA from Durham region, York region, Mississauga, Brampton, Barrie, Hamilton, Mr. Speaker. I spoke to transit workers, students, seniors, and daily commuters. And one thing is crystal clear, Mr. Speaker, under the leadership of Premier Ford, we are making life more affordable for the people of this province, Mr. Speaker. While other parties are distracted, we are focused on keeping costs down and putting more money back into the people's pocket, Mr. Speaker. Our government launched one fair, and this is going to enable seniors, parents, students, go from one transit Response. region to another transit region, Mr. Speaker. Only pay one fare, Mr. Speaker. That will save $1,600, Mr. Speaker. Started earlier this week, we will continue. Thank you. The next question, the member for London North Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. At pre-budget consultations, the Executive Director of Children's Aid Society of London and Middlesex told the committee that as of October 2023, London had, and I quote, six youth in care who are not otherwise in need of protection, but for lack of access to these mental health services. Is this government aware that children are being placed into protection simply so they can access mental health services? And what can the Premier say to families who are living with the pain of surrendering a child because they need access to mental health services? In social services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. Speaker, every single, uh, every single child, every single youth in this province deserves to have a chance at a life to succeed and thrive in their communities, Mr. Speaker, and we take the protection of every single child and every youth very seriously, Mr. Speaker, and that means making sure what we, pro we provide them with the right supports and services and that protection throughout that state, Mr. Speaker, and that means having the investments to protect the youth in every corner in this province, Mr. Speaker. If you look at the Ready, Set, Go program, Mr. Speaker, if you look at the program that we have set, Speaker, we are providing supports for children and youth in care as, as young as 13 years old with the life skills to succeed in their communities at 15 and with financial support right up to their 23rd birthday, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. That support never existed, and that's because we said from day one, we Response. will never leave anyone behind in this province, Mr. That's Speaker, true. whether you're in care or not. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. This House stands in point of order. The member for Sault Ste. Marie. Mr. Speaker, uh, 
did not get a chance to do this earlier, but I'd like to be able to uh, introduce uh, party and welcome uh, to the House today Katie Blunt, CEO, and Alison Schmidt, Chair of the Board of Habitat for Humanity in Sault Ste. Marie. I know they were just in the room and, uh, and, and left a little bit early, but I just want to thank them for being here and look forward to seeing them later today. Thank you. I gather Minister of Transportation has a point of order. He's standing up. Uh, Stephen Pickett, uh, who works in my office, is in the gallery today as well. Just want to welcome him to the house. There being no further business at this time, this house stands in recess until 3 p.m.